participants for attending our first ever PFS Market Noise Live. So uh, thank you for being the guinea pig. So we're all going to learn from this. So uh, we're going to make this easier and better. Our, our goal here is to, to do this once a quarter. Um, and uh, of course, Cynthia, Amy, and myself decided to pick the best time to do this when the markets are going crazy, everyone's worried. And um, how do we create some clarity from uh, all, the, all that's going on? So um, for those that uh, don't know all of us, uh, my name is Frank Fantosi. I'm, I'm president and founder of Plan Financial Services. Uh, joining me are, are two of my uh, uh, very you know, proud team members that I have, Cynthia Yang, who, who leads our uh, investment team, and then uh, Amy Valentine, who's part of the investment team, is also a senior wealth advisor along with Cynthia. And so we're here to um, go through some, I think, key topics that are timely and, and relative. Um, we're going to focus on inflation, you know, this whole discussion, on are we or are we not going to go into recession? Uh, a little bit about the jobs market. And, the, you know, the one qualifier I will say is we, we don't have a crystal ball. I don't think anyone has a crystal ball. Um, Mark, Mark Twain always used to say history has a way of repeating itself, but it always looks a little different each time. Um, and you'll find based on our discussion today that um, it, it will be a little different um, based on some of the things we'll, you know, we'll point out. And, and the big pivotal change was, was, was COVID. Um, but I, I want to make sure we put some context on this. Uh, what, what I've found in, in 27 years of being in the financial services business is that it's human nature to kind of focus in the immediacy of what we're going through. And we tend not to take a bigger step and look at the macro. And what I mean by that is you've heard the expression, we, you, know, you kind of get lost in the weeds and you can't see the forest from the trees. And I think that's some of the, the stress that's going on. And the one thing that you'll see when we talk about this is betting against the market is, is usually not a good thing. And that the longer we look at the market, in other words, time frame, the market becomes much, much more predictable in, in regards to its behavior and how it works. Now, the journey in between sometimes isn't, isn't always there. So um, I do also want to start with, with two little, you know, two little, one's a quote, one's a little bit of a story to help create this context. Um, you know, Warren Buffett always says, you know, you need to be fearful uh, when others are greedy and you need to be greedy when others are fearful. And I think that's very appropriate right now because there's a lot of fearful people, but does that mean we should really be greedy and look at, looking at what's going on as an opportunistic way of, of investing when you look at this? And we'll relate some of this to, um, you know, how, how does this really influence, if at all, your approach to, you know, in, in investing. And so the, the one little story I want to start with, and then I'm going to, you know, turn it over to Cynthia and, and Amy as well, is that, and I don't know how many of you ever watched the movie uh, Back to the Future, involves some time travel, right? You, go, you know, uh, Marty McFly goes back and he you know, he's going back to see someone and, and kind of talk about, you know, what's happening so we can straighten out the future. And, um, you know, the Dow Jones was actually founded in 1896. And, you know, uh, the Dow in, in, in 1900 was at 50. Okay. Now, let's say you go back to talk to yourself and you say, I'm going to tell you all the things that have happened, you know, all the crazy bad things that have happened in, in 122 years all the world wars, the pandemics, all the negative things that have happened, oil crises. You know, think about all the crazy bad things that have happened in 122 years. And I'm going to ask you to ask yourself, tell me in 122 years, where do you think the Dow is going to be? Knowing all the negative things that have happened in 122 years, would you be able to tell you, even with this pullback, would we be around 30,000? Or are you going to say, to her, God, I don't know if the Dow is going to change at all. You know, maybe it'll move from 50 to 80. So the, the reason I, I share this is to really create context because when we're in the immediacy of what we're at, it really, people tend not to look at how we got here, the things that we've been through. And, and let's just look at the last really 15 years, 20 years. We, we've been through dot-com, you know, and then we actually had Y2K. Remember where the world was all supposed to, supposed to end with Y2K. We had the dot-com, which was pretty disruptive. And then we had the Great Recession, which barring the Great Depression, was the single worst economic setback we've had. Yet, we're here, right? We're at 30,000, even with the, with the pullback. So I want, I want to paint a picture of 
reality of how we're, we, we work as a society and as an economy and not to get into the weeds and say, well, geez, you know, you know, we're, we're never going to recover. It's, it's doomsday again. So, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to um, Cynthia and Amy to start. Um, and then what we'll do is uh, when we're done with our, um, you know, commentary on some of the things we want to talk about, we're going to open it up to a Q&A. Um, feel free to use the chat room. Uh, you can you can type in your questions. We'll look at it, all the questions. And we'll try to address them um, at the end, and um, we'll go we'll go from there. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over, and uh, let's get the show on the road. Thank you, Frank. Um, Cynthia, would you turn to the next slide, please? Um, so obviously, the first topic we're going to cover is inflation. Uh, it's on top of everybody's mind. Um, last week, the May Consumer Price Index, CPI, uh, came in at 8.6%, uh, which is the biggest annual increase that we ever seen since uh, the late 1980s. Uh, uh, As you can see from this chart, uh, the line really showing, the blue line showing the head headline CPI, which is including food and energy. And uh, so that the dark gray line showing the core CPI, uh, it's excluding those two items. And those um, increase, of course, uh, we, you and I, all of us uh, are feeling the pain uh, at the gas pump, grocery store, and at our very restaurant. Uh, and seriously, you see the portion of the meal just shrinks, and that's just not feeling, not a good feeling. Um, so inflation has been and remains a big concern for the investor and obviously keep weighing on the confidence and the market sentiment. The key questions um, many of you asked are how long the high inflation will last and are inflation going to go higher from here? Um, so to answer the questions, I would like to us to look at the next chart. This is really showing us how uh, the inflations um, increased over time since March of 2021. Uh, as you can see, it breaks down to different components of inflations. Uh, what I would like to draw your attention to is go all the way to the right. Uh, this data obviously only show till February 2022, but we are kind of breaking down uh, looking under the hook of the inflation makeup. So as you can see, their portion of the inflation increase since um, last year was uh, so-called transitory. Um, those you can see in the green portion, red portion, and the um, purple portion. Um, those are energy, new and used car vehicles, and food inflation. Um, so typically fat, U.S. fat, don't keep their focus on this area. What they're more focusing and concerns with is the, the bottom portion is the more sticky, we call the sticky uh, inflation, which are the gray, blue, and light blue portion. Um, you know, those are your um, rent, house furnishing, apparels, service sectors. So those are uh, more concerned uh, for FED traditionally. And, and typically that's where they're policy could make more inference on. Um, what I would like to draw your attention is to, uh, is the next slide. Um, we all know that energy is one of the major contributor to the transitory inflation. Um, and we knew that the fundamental of the driver for the energy price is supply and demand. Um, really, US administration has more power uh, versus Fed to help ease the energy price with some short-term intervention or long-term policy changes. Um, and while no one knows the exact timing, but the eventual ceasefire between Ukraine and Russia could, could definitely remove some, some of the upward pressure. Um, and one good news we can share with you is that at least there's no sign of the natural price supplies from Russia to Ukraine uh, will be cut off at this point, uh, which could be a even worse situation. 
this chart we want to draw your attention to is what we know as a fact, um, showing that if you follow the green line, it's really showing the energy um, spending as a percentage of a consumer's wallet. Starting from 1950 to uh, most recently, you can see the percentage of the wallet um, that energy comprise of, the, um, it, it is uh, trending lower. Um, so if you can look at the top right char, uh, kind of chart, you can see the median income uh, from 2011 to 2014 average is about 52,000. Um, and current household income, median income is about 67,000. Um, so even though we are back to about uh, 2011, 2014 level from an energy price standpoint, really as a percentage why um, consumer does have more buffer and less susceptible to the energy spike. So that's one positive thing that we would like to um, share with you. Um, another thing we can look at is future contracts. Um, it does provide some indication of how the price uh, is going to be developed down the road. So here you're seeing um, the first column showing different uh, future oil future contracts uh, contract from July to December. Um, the second column showing you those contract price. As you can see from the top to the bottom, it's down uh, up from down from 120 to 107. So the trend is going down as from as far as from a market expectation standpoint. Um, the next major component that attribute to the upside of the inflation compared to a pre-pandemic pre level um, is coming from the goods. So if we could look at the next slide, and then particularly it's from the used and new cars um, because of the chip shortage and the low inventory. Um, while we know that supply chains remain stretched and the delivery time are still lengthy, uh, they have shown some signs of improvement. As you can see, this chart is looking at the blue line um, showing the fat supply chain pressure index. It comprises of, um, say, transportation costs and all kinds of measurements. Um, you can see it's actually started to trend down. Um, and we see some good indication there. Um, for example, used car and truck prices have come down significantly over the past two months. Um, also shipping costs have also dropped nicely. Uh, I think the most important part is the world's second largest economy, China, has recently lifted the two month Omicron lockdown. So cargo flows are slowly working through the bottleneck right now. And you can see from the economic data from China, surprisingly in their April, um, actually it's main purchasing manager index, which is an indicator to look at if the economy is in contraction or expansion. So if at the above 50, meaning it's at the expansion, below 50 is at the contraction level. So we actually see a surprisingly increase and reverse trend um, from 47.5 to 49.5 for China's uh, purchase um, manager index. So those are all good signs. Um, but even though there are signs that showing that inflation may have peak, um, we understand that there may be many months before all of us feel the benefits. Uh, again, you can see this chart, um, the orange line showing the CPI. Uh, it always have about four months of lag, um, followed by you know, the, uh, the supply chain issue. So it's going to take a while for us to feel it. Um, but looking forward, we do expect the transitory inflation component to eventually subside. And we are predicting that uh, inflation will drop at least one to 1.5% by the end of the year. Um, while it's not a huge relief, um, we think the directional change to a lower level 
is an important important signs of improvement. Um, so that's what we have prepared for the inflation part. I'm going to pause here to see if any of you have any questions. Uh, we can take one or two questions here. Remember, you can uh, write in the chat box and um, or you can try the Q&A. We're looking at that aspect as well. Uh, but the chat box, you can send a message and we'll look at it. Okay. okay. Um, so if we don't have any question, um, let's um, move on to the next. A uh, hot topic is Fed and the interest rate. Um, so first of all, we all know that Fed has two major major goals. Uh, one is the maximum uh, employment. The other one is price stability. So which is known as the Fed's dual mandate. Uh, on the first mandate, maximum employment. Uh, traditionally, Fed has concentrated on unemployment um, and focused on the number of workers that who cannot find jobs. Uh, in today's environment, uh, which is very unique, Fed is actually concerned about the numbers of firms cannot find workers. Um, so as we speak, there are more job openings than uh, you know numbers of people seeking for jobs. So it's eleven millions of job opening versus six millions of people seeking for job. Um, so Fed is not overly concerning about that at this point. Um, right now, the unemployment rate is at historic low, below 4%. One positive thing we can talk about this year is if the cost of inflation, cost of living keep increasing, that will probably force a lot of people who have left the workforce um, since the pandemic, uh, so-called the great res uh, resignation. It will force them to come off the sideline and come back to the workplace. Um, and hopefully that will um, bring back millions of workers and eventually will help help fast solve the problem, the supply demand uh, imbalance issue in the labor markets. And in a sense, it's positive because it will help prevent further hawkish uh, move on Fed, meaning Fed doesn't need to raise rates uh, more aggressively or more as expected, because by the time people come back, uh, hopefully that will reduce, uh, ease a little bit pressure on the wage um, and also may uh, be able to help a little bit on the spending side. So that's one positive. Uh, notes that you, we don't hear much from the news um, because we all focus so much on the rising interest rate. Um, the second part is really, we want to focus on this uh, slide a little bit. Um, the second mandate of Fed is to keep core inflation, uh, which is excluding food and energy at the target level at 2%. Um, so Fed used interest rate to tam increase the interest rate to tame down the demand and pull down the inflation. And mostly it's focused on the sticky part that we talked about earlier, those type of inflation. Um, so be begin on um, March, we have our first rate high this year with uh, we say 25 bits, 0.25% of rate increase. And then 0.5% uh, increase in May. And as you all are aware, this past Wednesday, uh, Fed just increased another 0.75% uh, of rates, which is our third rate high this year, but also the most aggressive um, rate increase since 1994. Um, you can see from markets uh, reaction, the first day markets are happy because they feel, Fed finally feel uh, focus on uh, the headline inflation, which is food and energy that really uh, have been driving this uh, inflation hike. They're finally going to take consideration and look into it and into their model and not just putting their heads in the sand. 
Um, this show their commitment. They are going to deal with the inflation before it go out of hands. Um, but the next day we see the market sold out because at the same time, we people and markets are worried about uh, too aggressive move will put us in the recession. So none of us know how uh, future will hold, but um, it's important for us to learn something from the history here um, as we go through this challenging time. So this chart, we're really looking at um, the last 13 rate hike cycles uh, from 1955 to the most recent one, December 2015. Um, so from left to right, you're looking at the start time of the hike and the end time of the hike and how many months it lasts. And the middle session showing the start rate when the first hike begins and the ending rates, as well as the change with uh, during the first year. Really just the last two column I would like you to focus on is when does the next recession start um, from the first hike, uh, the beginning of first hike. Um, if you can, we can draw the attention to the high, blue high line, which is the last uh, two row from the bottom. Um, you can see from the left to right, the average cycle uh, lasts about 23 months. The average rate increases about 2.6%. And it takes on average about 43 months from the beginning of the first hike for the economy to fall into a recession. Um, so even though we know every cycle is different, we have different economic uh, backdrop, uh, we can at least draw a baseline here. So far we know this year, we're probably going to look at a 3% total increase. So market really are concerned, are we too aggressive? Is this too fast? But if we put it in the historical uh, context, uh, this is actually not out of norm. And, and really, if we can draw your attention to 1994 to 1995, uh, in that year, we have about seven rate hikes. Um, and at the time is the Green, Alan Greenspan actually was able to orchestrate a soft landing uh, without a recession during that time from 3% of rate hike to 6%. And then if you look at the number all the way to the right during that time, it really took seven years until we hit another recession, which is April of 20, uh, 2001. And again, that wasn't a Fed driven recession. It was driven by excess inventory. Um, I think most importantly is what does this relate to you? Um, if you are a more conservative uh, investor, you have time to work with your advisor, us, to prepare at least a year of your cash need to navigate the storm, because we know the average recession lasts about 12 months. Um, but if you are a more aggressive investor, uh, I would really like to show you the next chart. This is really showing the blue line on the top, showing you the uh, Fed fund rate uh, starting from uh, late 72 um, uh, now. Um, I really want to draw your attention on the chart at the bottom, which is the second row from the bottom, the S&P 500 return. Looking all the way to the right, the last column, you can see the average uh, return during the rate high for S&P 500 was 5.8%. Is, was while it's not great, it's not bad as people thought either. If you like to see the worst scenario, which is the 80, go the all the way to the first, uh, the second column, it was down 9.6% during that time. Um, but but again, if we if we could just stay on uh, focus on the long term, really the average expansion last four years. So we should probably position our portfolio um, more toward expansion versus uh, being too conservatively. And again, this is really want to put you, um, kind of show you the historic context before we make any drastic move for 
uh, your portfolio. Um, and next, I would like to show you the next chart really is another positive uh, sign, uh, especially at this depressing time. Uh, it's, it's very typical um, to see some sell off three months during uh, before, during and after the initial rate hike. But then we know for a fact that after six months, you can look at the great bar, which is the S&P 500 index, the market returned positively um, at 5.6% and 12 months out at 9.2%. Um, and then for those of you are our clients in your portfolio, you also have some allocation to um, a dividend growing uh, funds and exposure, which is the represented by the green bar. And those funds typically navigate better and provide better return during this time. Um, you can see 12 months out, it's at the 11%. Um, so I hope that provide a little bit positive um, side to you and uh, some clarity um, at this point of time. Um, all being said, we recognize it's it's a challenging task for Fed to orchestrate soft lending, uh, but there's still positive no here, and then we know from historical expected, a uh, patient investor will get rewarded. Um, so, before I close this section, do we have any question? And you're welcome to put the question in the chat box. And while you're writing some questions, I, I do want to add a couple of things. I mean, listen, we're, we're also not new to the news, tends to always paint, um, you know, much more negative outlook than, uh, you know, finding the layers of, of, of good news. And sometimes what happens is the market, uh, the news doesn't really want to dig into a few things. So I, I want to add a couple points to add on top of what Amy shared. So as Amy pointed out, the, the the Fed has that dual mandate of low inflation, low inflation, and um, you know, high, uh, low unemployment, um, or high employment, where you want to look at it. And and really, the Fed has one tool. Okay, it can either increase the demand or lower the demand in the money supply that impacts what they call the interest sensitive parts and the cyclical parts of of, of the economy. And in going back since World War II, um, we've had 13 recessions, 14 if you count COVID. Now, we personally don't believe COVID was a recession, and, and here, here's why. Sure, there was a severe pullback, and it met the, you know, the stereotypical definition of two quarters of negative GDP, we, we have a you know, recession. But here's what was not typical of a recession. In, in a recession time, what happens is usually your durable goods purchases go down, housing goes down, um, you know, broad purchases go down. Well, that was the exact opposite. During COVID, housing purchases went up, consumer purchases went up. All that was opposite of what happened. What, what really changed during COVID was the service industry. You know, going to the dentist, which is, you know, usually recessionary proof. Going and getting elective surgeries is re usually recessionary proof. So it really flipped differently. And so that's why there's a lot of debate. We feel that COVID, while that was a big pullback, was, was not a, a typical recession as the recession had, with the, all the other 13 recessions that were prior. And that's part of the reason why we're not really stating at this point that we're you know, heading into a recession. And so the reason why I bring that up is typically when you, when you, when you have um, uh, high demand inflation, the, the Fed wants to cool the economy because there's, there's typical demand, there's over demand. That's your typical reaction by the Fed to, to, to cool things. But what, what also happened is there's this pent up demand for service. So, you know, why is it right now numbers are skyrocketing with travel if we're going into a recessionary time? There's this pent up demand for service. Remember, the, the Fed flooded the market, and rightfully so, and then we, we can debate that a little bit, but they flooded it with $2.8 trillion of money. Now, was all that money spent in 2021? I mean, based on um, people's balance sheets, when you look at home equities, which, you know, home equity, equity in homes is as high as it's ever been, 
balance sheet savings as high as it's been. So there's a lot of people out there, including us, feeling that there's still money out there that's that's going to be in play, creating you know some of this pent, you know pent up demand that's really a sub, what they call supply shock, side shock. So we have two of those things going on right now. We have traditional demand. You know, the war in Ukraine is creating tr traditional demand issues. You know, energy, food supply, things like that. But we still have this service demand that is challenged. Um, you know, the economy. So that that's part of what's going on. And I think the reason why the Fed has been slow. Now we can argue that the flat Fed knew last year that COVID was kind of going on its way out and probably should have started increasing interest rates sooner. So now they're, you know, they're playing a little, um, you know, uh, catch up. But the reason why I think they've been a little slow to the, to the game here, and, and they're waiting to see what's happening with the service sector and this pent up demand, because here's what happens, you know, and we haven't mentioned stagflation, but if you have traditional demand inflation and you put pump the brakes by increasing inflation, that should be fine. What happens is if it's if it's um, inflation called by supply shock, and you go to pump on the brakes, inflation's still going to be there. And the only thing you're going to do is you're going to create unemployment, and that's where you can potentially get stagflation, where you have high inflation and, and higher un un unemployment. So that that's part of it. The other part is, you know, what we're also dealing with is there hasn't been any real wage growth in relative to inflation. So companies have actually so, you know, Amy talked about the tightening of the market. Well, we just got recent data. I, I was at a conference a couple of days ago in, in Chicago. It, it's basically number of people employed and people in the workforce, or it's almost identical to what has been pre-COVID now. Um, and, and part of that is people say, well, why is it a tighter? Why does it feel like a tighter market? Well, a, a stat that hasn't been talked about in a while is, is that new business formations up until about a year or so ago it has been on the decline. And now what a lot of people have said is, hey, I'm not going to work for the boss anymore. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do my own gig. I'm going to start my own uh, startup. So startups have actually been on the rise, which has actually been very positive. So people have made a choice in the workforce to work, you know, uh, you know, work differently. And so, so when you look back at history a little bit, there's only been three times. So typically when you have really low inflation, um, uh, um, low unemployment, below 4%, you tend to get what, you know, uh, wage increase, right? The, the three times that we didn't have inflation was in the mid 1990s, mid 2000s, and right before COVID, we didn't really have any inflation. So now what's happened is inflation's going off and, and, and wages are rising a little bit, but the, the profit margin that's been all passed through. So companies have been tipping, are booking that as profit. Typically what you have when you have a tight labor market is wages go way up and profits go down, and that hasn't that ha that hasn't happened yet. So those are some of the things that we're we're seeing that we feel that we're we're not heading in a recession. And part of the reason why the Fed has been again a little bit slow to make the change because they're looking at the next three months. We think the next three months are going to be critical to see what happens with inflation. Is this supply shock? I mean, there's going to be some demand inflation that's going to stay there. You know, blame it on the uh, you know war in Ukraine and some other things. But part of it is this the supply shock uh, demand that we think is going to start to work its way out. And Amy pointed it out with just some of the things that are, are, are changing in regards to supply side. So that's why again the Fed's been a little slower to be you know too aggressive because if they if they stop on the brakes too much, and and, and it is supply shock demand that's really the problem, it's going to for, fast forward us closer to stagflation, which they're, they're wor you know, worried about. And again, the, they only have one tool. It's, it's either they put, on the, they put on the brakes or let off and, and let the economy, you know, economy steamroll. And the reason, and there's one other fact, uh, the reason why we think this is more fiscal, fiscally driven is the UK, Germany, and Japan, which has been in a, in a uh, deflationary time, all have had reported uh, highest inflation in, in 40 years. So how is it all these countries, including us, are reporting high inflation when, when, really, when we really think it could have been fiscally driven, when it's really, really things external that are driving, you know, driving this inflation? 
So these are things that we're, we're peeling back and, and doesn't, it doesn't really get reported in the news because it's almost too, too much information to get in their sound bites during uh, their news shows that lead us to believe that the Fed's gonna be conservative more in, in, in regards to increasing rates and they wanna see how things play out because if they, if they do this wrong, they're, they're gonna have a bigger problem to deal with. Uh, and, and it's easier, it's probably better to be a little more uh, precautionary about putting on, on the brakes because we've only been in it, you know, this part of it for, for about five months. And, um, you know, s- seeing things play out is probably a little more prudent than, than, than everyone screaming that they got to st- step on the brakes. And that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. So those are some additional things I wanted to, data points that I wanted to, to share. Um, I know we have a couple questions here. So if Amy and Cynthia, you want to address them? Thanks. I think um, we have one question came in. Um, really, if, if we are, if clients are going to retire in a year and a half or within two years, um, should they make any changes right now? And are we um, proactively making changes? Um, so we, we actually, Cynthia will be talking about some of the portfolio positioning we have been taking. Um, so I'm going to just uh, leave it there. And I do want to point out, uh, sometimes people think that we just kind of ride the type. Uh, it's not that, we actually make some changes underneath. So, so we will address a little bit later, uh, Cynthia will talk about it. Um, so with, um, Following up Frank's comments, Cynthia will talk more about uh, are we really going to uh, recession? Yep. So yeah, everybody has been asking this big question, are we heading into a recession? Amy discussed about the stubborn high inflation, rising interest rate, and beyond that, we have elevated geopolitical tensions and ongoing supply chain bottlenecks. So really are we heading into a recession? So really timing the, ex- to predict the exact timing of a recession is impossible. But uh, we use this recession risk dashboard that has been historically uh, shining some warning signs on average six to seven months ahead of a recession. It has been done a great job in the past So when we go through these um, 12 variables, we're using a stop-like analogy where those greens indicating expansion, yellow is caution, and red is recession. Comparing to March, yes, there are some indicators are slightly deteriorating, but it stays the same comparing to April overall we still have eight grains, three yellows, and only one right signal there. And this one indicator is the wheat growth that Frank tapped a little bit about it. Wheat growth is kind of a double-edged sword. On one hand, we would like to expect a reasonable, reasonable healthy wheat growth that gonna pop more cash to consumers' hand and to help boost the consumer consumption, which is the primary driver of the US economy. But on the other hand, um, when you have wheat growth that is too strong, it can reduce or kill the uh, corporate earnings. So that's one thing that has been, we have been watching. Um, right now, the wheat growth, it hasn't really catch up with the inflation yet, but in the stage that is worth concerning. But the turning point, we do see that in the last three months, which growths have been moderating comparing to the beginning of the year. It was around 6.1% at the beginning of the year. And in the last three months, it came down to about 3.7%. So it's coming to the more healthy range that we're looking for. And another thing that is which growth tend to be one of the longer indicators uh, way ahead of the recession. So that also give us some relief. Overall, we do feel like the probability of recession goes up 
because we do have some of those uh, deteriorating indicators more compared to two, three months ago. But um, the US consumer has been very strong. The job market has been very strong. Um, again, Fed is data dependent. When we have those decelerating pace in the wage growth, we have commodity price coming down to a reasonable level. Fed gonna look at all of these and determine that if they want to continue to be as aggressive as they were planning um, right now, or they can slow down the pace of the monetary, uh, the monetary policy tightening later this year. The next page is just give you more of a comparison of how those 12 indicators we're looking at in the past recession we have been experienced before. Uh, in 2001, before the tech bubble burst, we, the whole dashboard is red with only one yellow signal. Again, in 2007, 2009, before the great financial crisis, we have 10 red lights and two are yellow. There was no green in those two recessions we experienced in the past. Right now, we're still standing in the overall pretty healthy um, economy. Now, Frank has been uh, discussed, covered a little bit about uh, a pullback and the market crash. Really, the key difference between the two is a pullback tend to be much more short-lived. When we have a pullback, it takes about four and a half months to recover, where a market crash can take us more than 18 months to recover. Uh, we all know that it could be nerve wracking to see the market drop around 20% in a short period of time. But historically, when we look at the past pullback we had before, we were, we, we had been there that the market pulled back around 20% in a short period of time. And then later after that, it, the market posted some meaningful positive returns and there was no recession follow it. So uh, 2001, again, uh, we had a 19% pullback in April, 2011 to October, 2011. 12 months after that, S&P added 6% positive return, and that did not lead us to a recession. Again, September 2018 to December 2018, in that 82 days, market dropped 19%, and following that, S&P added 10% positive returns, and we did not have a recession follow that. Another point I would like to add is, um, Yes, the a recession, we, we don't really think the recession is right around the corner, but even if there is a recession, it's possible that we can have some positive returns. When we look at the, uh, the past recessions since 1945, we had all those recessions, but the average S&P returns were positive 3.68%. And the period that I would like to draw your attention is 1980 to 1982. This is a period of time uh, has a lot of similarity to what we're experiencing today. In those two year time window, we actually had two recessions. And this was the period of time there was this um, Iranian revolution that doubled, more than doubled the oil price within 12 months. And Fed were raised interest rates trying to reduce the inflation. So very similar market condition as we're experiencing today. And the GDP during those two years time frame, there were six quarters of negative GDP during the uh, whole measure of 12 quarters. But in the first recession between January 1980 to July 1980, S&P were actually up 
0.39%. And in the following recession between July 1981 to November 1982, uh, S&P were up 10%. So it, it, I mean, uh, it, it is never fun to watch the short-term market volatility. Um, however, when we evaluate and look at the current investment strategy um, to determine whether this is the right one for you, uh, we have to put into the context of your investment horizon, your financial goal, and your liquidity uh, cash needs. So one of the questions that we had were just asking about, hey, I'm ready to retire in one and a half years. What should I do? Well, if there is any change in your financial goals, your investment horizon, and your liquidity needs, yes, we should always reevaluate whether the current investment uh, strategy is the right one for you. But if, there, if all the answers to the above questions are no, uh, we would suggest you stay in the course and remain invested. Your patience will be rewarded. When we look at the past uh, 96 years, S&Ps had 71 positive years, only 25 negative years. Uh, Normally, when, when we're focused on the short term, dealing with the daily market volatility, it more feels like we're flipping the coin that the next day market either goes up or goes down. It feels like a 50-50% chance. But if we zoom out, look at the much more longer investment horizon, market actually added positive returns much more than an active returns. And when we look at the um, calendar year return, a lot of those years that we could experience intra-year pullback or intra-year market job, which are more significant, but uh, the calendar year could still potentially close in the positive territory. The two um, years that we could look at, one was in 2011. We had an intra-year job between April to October. We closed that year in the positive 2.11, 2.11%. Uh, 2 Again, in 2018, we had another job of 19% between September to December and the year closed with a much more moderate loss of 4.38%. When we think about changing a strategy in response or uh, being reactive to the market job, uh, it's like timing the market. Timing the market is very challenging. You have to be right to determine when you want to get out of the market and when you would get back into the market. And it could be very costly if we time the market wrong. For the past 10 decades, our average return will be 70% lower if we just miss the 10 best days. Instead of having an average of 101% returns, if we stay invested, we would only end up having a 34% average return if we just miss the 10 best days. The other uh, point I would like to add to it is normally and most likely the best days are cluttered around the worst days. In the last 20 years, seven of the best 10 days occurred within the two weeks of the worst 10 days. So if you're fully invested through that 20 year time frame, you would have average return of 7.47%. If you miss just the best 10 days, your return would be only around 3.35%. And if you miss the best 20 days, 
your return is close to zero. So unless there, there's really changes in your investment horizon, your goals, or you need some short-term cash that we can always discuss and evaluate whether the strategy is still the right one for you, uh, please remain invested. You will be rewarded for your patience. All right. well, we have All right. I just want to add a couple of things, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. One, another reason why we don't we think the market does not believe um, this will last is if you look at mortgage rates right now, they're at six percent. Inflation's at eight percent. So institutions are losing money. If you think about back in, I don't think. Cynthia was around and Amy might've been just in diapers at this time, but back in the late seventies, eighties, when you had uh, super high inflation, uh, interest rates were higher than inflation during that time because they believed it was systemic and it was gonna be around. So why, why would banks be lending at 6% when 8% 8, 8 inflation? So that's one thing I wanted to point out. And the other is when you look at real output since COVID started, it's actually up 5%. So these are, like I said, indicators that keep telling us intrinsically we think this, this will correct itself. And, and listen, we're sensitive to this. I mean, we're, we all invest as well here. I mean, I have my own investment portfolio, Cynthia and Amy have their own. And, you know, it's great. You know, you, you pick your investment strategy and you increase this value. No one wants to give some of it back, you know, in a de decrease in value. And, and I mean that in a decrease because you're not realizing any loss. But remember what got you there. You picked an inf investment strategy to hit certain goals, to hit certain returns. So you were rewarded for that. And you know, the market temporarily pulls some of that back. Is it, does it mean that you throw up the white flag and you know, uh, run away? Because if you would have taken a much more conservative view, and I have a very conservative mother, and she, I said, hey, if you would have put it in the bank during this whole time, quote, considered it being safe, you would still have less money. Okay, that, that's, that, you know, I've run the calculations, and you mean Cynthia have done the same. You would, if you would have taken a more conservative track not to have these kind of pullbacks, you would still have less money than we're in right now, given the fact that the, the, the market, you know, is pulled back and is hanging around 30,000 right now. Uh, and again, we, we still think that that's a, it's going to be more of a temporary change. And we have to let this year kind of, you know, filter it out. And again, we can't promise that. I, we, we're just, because we don't have the crystal ball either, but we're looking at indicators that I think the news doesn't talk about that make us feel that you know, the, the ship will kind of write itself out. But let, let's just take a worst case scenario. We, we go into a full blown recession. All right, average recession, 12, 13, 14 months. If, if as Cynthia pointed out, you have liquidity needs. If that liquidity need is, is set aside from your longer term portfolio, then you're not gonna be able, you're not gonna be hurt by pulling money out at, at, during that time from that port, portion. And you can let your portfolio, which is, sustained its returns over a longer period of time to kind of play out the strategy that it was designed to, to, to do. So again, you know, even at a worst case scenario, we, we feel that if you, your, your liquidity need is already being handled, that your portfolio is positioned correctly uh, based on the changes that have been made to, to, to take it forward to where we see opportunity. And we're going to get into the positive trends and things down the road here with Amy and, 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 and some of the things I'll conclude with. But there are a lot of positive things that are in in the pipeline. It might be immediate, immediate, but it, it's 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 where the markets tend to go because we're an innovative society. So with that, I just want to pass pass it on here. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Um, and then to all of you uh, participate in the webinar, I do apologize. We might run a little bit over time, uh, but if you need to leave, we we'll want to let you know this webinar is being recorded. We can send it to you later. Um, so I will not um, go on without talk about some positive trends uh, for you to feel better over the weekend. Uh, one really main trend is um, we feel like the consumers are still in very good shape uh, despite, despite of all the concerns we have. Um, as you can see in this chart, uh, really the bars, uh, the blue bar showing how much uh, household um, cash household, US, US household have in their accounts. Uh, you can see from 
um, you re really compared to pre-pandemic, pre the household cash has increased uh, about three trillion dollar uh, versus 2019 level, and that's way higher than the 2008 um, the deep recession period. So we do feel like um, the savings could buffer the uh, current inflation this time. Um, so with the the other positive sign is the next chart. Um, also, the U.S. household hasn't been taking on uh, too excessive debt since uh, 2008 uh, financial crisis. And we are looking at this chart is showing the debt payment as a percentage of a dis disposable personal income. Uh, it has come down quite a bit at the almost 40 years low at 9.2%. So the implication is with the lower debt um, and more cash on the sideline and, and st stronger wage, it meaning that consumer can still um, have some dry powder, um, even though it may be delayed spending because uh, inflation. The next positive uh, area I would like to point out is, yes, we know that the economists has been cutting back their GDP uh, forecast since the start of the year. Uh, if you look at this chart, uh, the blue line representing the U.S. GDP forecast has been cut back to uh, below 2.5%. Uh, uh, with the Fed recent announcements, uh, right now we're looking at about 2%, which is um, right around 20 years average trend line. Uh, that being said, if you look at the next chart, which is um, the earning estimate put out by the analysts. Also starting from this year to most recently, it's trending up. Um, so the diversion in the direction of economic and earning forecasts is really rare to see, um, but it's not that um, economic, economists and analysts have different outlooks. Uh, it's because they have different tasks. Uh, for example, the rising uh, energy prices in the current environment, it drag economy, but it may boost earning for the energy company uh, who made up the indexes. And also uh, company actually has been putting more investment in their, in, in their area. Uh, as we all know, last month, the CapEx, which is capital uh, expenditure, the company invest, it has increased almost 20% year over year. Um, really, when you invest in stock market, the gains come from the ability the company can grow their earning. So if you're again looking at the um, blue line, the U.S. company uh, represented by the S&P here, uh, we are forecasting about 10% year over year increase on earning growth. Uh, it's not uh, as good as last year, but it's they are excellent numbers Consider we are in a slower uh, economic growth environment. Um, the last chart I really want to share with you is, I personally feel very excited about this chart, especially if you are aggressive investor. This line showing you, chart showing you, um, if you follow the gray line, that's the consumer sentiment index. Um, so as you can see, we actually have the latest reading uh, it's right now at about 50 uh, uh, from what we know, the latest uh, post, which is the historical low. However, if you look at the blue dot, that's where the peak or trough of this uh, index is. Looking at uh, 2007, if you invest at that time, uh, January 2007, the next 12 month return you will get is minus 4%. But if you invest, say, August 2011, when the sentiment was so low, your next 12 month return will be 15%. And the period before is November 2008, your 12 month return will be 22%. Um, like Fran point out, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Um, for those of you that can stomach the market volatility, and you focus on the long term, this may provide some reason for you to slowly deploy your cash on the sideline right now.
Um, so with that, we really would like to, uh, for Cynthia to talk about some of our, this portfolio implication and how we have been positioning your portfolio to prepare for this environment. Yeah, thank you, Amy. So um, our recommendation is always remain invested unless there is a change. Uh, however, remain invested, stay in the course doesn't really mean that your portfolio stays static. We do monitor the market very closely and we do make tactical adjustment to your portfolio uh, to help navigate through those challenging market environment. Couple of things that we have done in the last couple of years. Uh, I'm just trying to summarize that what we have done, hopefully that'll give you um, a good context of how this could help you. So uh, value tilting is one of the things that we have been done gradually during the last two years. Back in 2019, 2019-2020, uh, we were very bullish about the technology and the growth stock. We overweight our uh, growth stock and that has been help us outperform our benchmark back in 2020. Now, heading into uh, 2021, value stock were very attractively valued. We took off some of the gains off the table from the growth stock added to the value positions and at the time, it was equally valued between value, equally weighted between value and growth positions. Now, at the beginning of 2021, with the concerns of those high inflation and expectation of rising interest rate, we tilted more towards the value stock at the beginning of the year. So this value tilting helped reduce the impact of the technology sell off in your portfolio. On the uh, bond allocation, we added floating rate in August of last year. And then this year we added mortgage backed security. Both bonds have very short duration between a year to two years uh, comparing to the intermediate term bond which have average five to seven years duration. The additional the addition of both bonds help your bond portfolio uh, reduce your bond duration to much lower point. And also it helped to provide a better protection against this rising interest rate risks. The other thing that we did is, it, I mean, it is very hard in the liquid market to find some investment strategies or options that can truly hedge the equity and the bond market risks. Because normally when investors jump the boat, they tend to sell all of their positions. Um, there is this low core commodity long short strategy is a fund that we added to your portfolio uh, about two years ago before COVID. When COVID hit, S&P was down 33%. This fund was up almost 15%. It was a 48% outperformance in that two months time frame. This year, S&P is down around 20%. Barclay Ag is down 12%. This fund is up more than 4%. Um, it's a, it outperformance a 24% comparing to the stock market and a 16% outperformance comparing to the bond market, which has been provide a great hedge during this volatile market. So again, we monitor the market continuously and trying to make tactical adjustment whenever needed to help you navigate through these challenging market conditions. Um, unless there is anything changed, we would just recommend you stay in the course and we will make the adjustment back the same to help you to go through this challenging environment. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, at this time, um, I would like to open the floor for uh, further question. 
Uh, again, if you could type in your question in the chat, chat box, and then we will try to address um, along the way. Yeah, while the questions come in, I, I do want to add a couple uh, comments. I mean, you know, a couple trends we saw happening because of COVID was, you know, reshoring, you know, supply side. Everyone was saying, hey, we got to take control. We can't have all of our production overseas. And you saw this trend about reshoring. And I think if you actually look at globalization as how it's happened over all these years, I think what will happen is once things settle, that will start to become a global economy again. And all this reshoring will change a little bit. I mean, a lot of it depends on technology, because at the end of the day, if you're, if you're a producer of product, you're looking at quality and price. And if you can make it cheaper for the same quality overseas, I think industry itself will naturally go back to globalization. I think what you'll see is a diversification in uh, globalization. In other words, traditionally, everything was in China. And I think what's going to happen is people are say, hey, we're not going to pull our eggs in one basket. If we have a problem with China, we're really stuck. So if we have production in other parts of the world, that's diversification. I mean, you know, I think what made COVID very unique is it just cut off our supply lines. And, and you think about history, maybe outside of wars, when, 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 has our, when has our supply lines have been cut? So when you look at it statistically, and, that, and that's how businesses are going to approach, say, all right, we can always have this risk that if we're overseas, we could have a problem. But if we look at actually the value of being overseas, assuming it's going to be cheaper and the quality is the same, you're going to see that that trend start to reverse. I think the other trend you'll see reverse over time is this, uh, basically people live in, leaving the big cities because of work from home. You saw Chicago, LA, New York, low, largest amounts of people leaving the city. But if you, if you go to any of the richest countries and you look at census data and just look at the US, every time cities have grown every 10 years, okay, people go to the urban areas. And I think you'll see that change. And I know there's more work from home, but I think the other thing you're going to find out is some people are going to go into the office. And, and when, when the people from work from home start to see, wow, this, this person's really good, they're going into the office and they're making more money and getting promoted, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't work from home, I should be in the office. So again, is it going to be an instantaneous change? No, but it, it, you, I think you'll see that as things settle back, you're going to see that pendulum start to go, go back and set a new norm. So where we're at today is not, is, is not the new norm. Um, and the last thing is things to look for. Um, so the internet has become pretty much what they call a, a foundational resource, right? There's not going to be really a lot more innovation coming over the internet. Yeah, there'll be changes in ads, but the big internet effect, it's here to stay, right? It's not going anywhere. Its penetration is great. So what's the next big, you know, foundational resource that'll become part of our lives? I mean, you think back, you know, mechanization back in the 1900s, electricity, uh, you know, computers before internet. So what's the next big one to look out for? Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence the, the, the quality and the learning is, is doubling every four months. And it wouldn't surprise me within the next year, year and a half, to see products be offered to mainstream consumers that have embedded artificial intelligence. So that's going to be the next foundational change. Now, I'm not predicting it for any of your movie, but I'm a movie buff, that it's going to be Terminator and computers are going to take over the world and you know, we're going to become useless. But the fact is there that computers are learning at a faster rate uh, than humans and, and the accuracy and what they can do is, is, is astounding. Uh, we're looking at technologies and, you know, we talk about batteries, right? And, you know, we have certain minerals that have these batteries in cars. Now they're developing technology with recycled plastic to be, be used as batteries. How is that going to change? They have enzymes now that can eat plastic, right? One of our biggest problems is plastic and they're developing enzymes to eat plastic now. So, the reason why I bring that up, regardless if we go into, uh, into a recession or not, the, the innovation capacity of the world, and especially the US, I would not bet against it. What we don't realize are all the things that are being developed that we don't even realize that are being developed that haven't hit mainstream. And when that hits mainstream, it's gonna drive, continue to drive the economy. So when I went back to that, that comment at the beginning when I said, hey, the Dow was at 50 122 years ago, 
and now we're at 30,000. And even though we know from history all the ugly things that have happened, we're still at 30,000. And the reason for that is the constant drive for innovation in a capitalistic world. That's not going to change. And if you bet against it, you're going to be on the wrong side uh, of, of you know, winning from a, a portfolio standpoint. So that's why there, the, you know, we tend to, you know, tend to be more uh, bullish about the economy, even though we go through these pullbacks or even if it is a recession, because I was here, you know, with everyone else during the great recession. And while it wasn't really pretty, we, we stayed to our core beliefs. When you set your goal from a planning standpoint, you develop a strategy for that goal and you find the right investments, you know, I mean, even an all-star, you know, you think about sports, even an all-star can have an off season. So if you, if you fundamentally believe you got the right investment, supporting the right strategy, supporting the right goal, why would you want to blow that up just because, you know, five months or a year, things aren't going that way. So that's, that's why you got to separate the emotion, which is hard to do because, you know, it's real money. You're looking at your values change. All right. You haven't realized anything, but again, you see a, a change of 10, 15, 20% on your statements and you're saying, wow, should I be reacting to this? And, and, and like I said in the beginning, you know, with, with Warren Buffett, you know, uh, you know, when, pe you know when, 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 when people are greedy, you know, you should be doing the opposite. When people are fearful, you should be doing the opposite. You know, it's, 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 it's having that discipline. And, and, and that's one of the things we do at our firm is to try to create clarity and discipline with our clients. While I think we do a great job managing money, also a big part of what we do is trying to create clarity and discipline to staying the course. So think about, you know, you hire someone to be your, your, um, your, your personal trainer. They create discipline and accountability so that you uh, attain those physical outcomes from hiring a coach. Part of our job is to be your financial coach and, and kind of walk you away from that ledge. Because emotionally, I get it. You, you, you want to sit there and say, God, I, I feel like I got to do something. But sometimes the best choice is the state of course, because that is a choice. It's not, it's not that you're conceding. It's that you know that it's the right thing to do, even though, you know, th those fears and those fears come from, you know, everyone has a different relationship with money, how you were raised with money, the things you experienced. I mean, if you talk to people, you know, th that are still with us from the Great Depression, they would tell you never to buy stocks. Why, why would you want to buy stocks? I was around when people were jumping out of buildings when the market crashed and, and they had this fear of buying the stock market. Well, do you think knowing all the data that we know? Would you think that is really a prudent way to invest by avoiding stocks? You know, so that, as I said, you get, you got to kind of isolate what's going on and, and really make decisions that are, that are prudent for what you're doing. And if they make sense, then you need to stick with the game plan and, and not let emotion drive, you know, irrational behavior, because then you're not going to get the results you want. So do we have any, oh, we have a couple more questions here. Okay. Oh, Wow. Can you discuss Bitcoin and the future of cryptocurrency? Any want, ladies want to take that since I was just rambling for a little bit? Well, I, I can uh, take that question. Well, this um, cryptocurrency market is still something that at this point we consider as the cumulative market. So there are tons of volatilities and there are political risks that uh, is still not clear at this point yet. Uh, in the past, we do see that the crypto, uh, crypto market has been have lower correlation. It kind of doing its own path, not quite related with both equities and the bond market. But in the last, during the last couple of the market job, we do started to see that there becomes more correlated with equity and the bond market. So. Um, there, I mean, there are some um, merits that make us believe um, with cryptocurrency and the blockchain technology, it could potentially become uh, one of the mainstream technology in the future. Uh, it's not there yet. So again, the same philosophy of the investment applies here with the cryptocurrency market and uh, um, blockchain just remain Diversification, uh, diversification is the, also the key here. When you are betting and investing in uh, individual cryptocurrency or uh, individual blockchain technology firms, um, there's tons of risk there, not just beyond 
the sector and the industry risks. So if you can stomach the volatility, the up and downs in the sector, in the market, make sure you build yourself a well-diversified portfolio in the cryptocurrency market, in the uh, blockchain technology market. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think there, there's a lot more potential in the, you know, the, the blockchain technology and in, its implications and how business will do, do business. So there's definitely a little more opportunity. And I, I think in that you're diversified within that, that industry. You know, one of the challenges with cryptocurrency is it's a currency, right? And, and so, you know, with all these, you know, countries running their own currency, currency you know, you got competition. And so do you think at some point, you know, countries will come in and try to regulate cryptocurrency or take it over if it becomes a, a means of, of doing business? So there's that, that you know, looming out there. So there's still a lot of unknown. So from an investment standpoint, if you want to do something a little more speculative, that's fine. But understand it's, it's, it is a speculative, you know, um, you know, industry at this point. But blockchain, it, it, you know, that, that technology is, is more useful beyond, beyond just cryptocurrency. Uh, and there's uses in blockchain that, you know, still are, uh, you know, undiscovered. And so that, again, that's still more speculative, but there's a little more diversification um, and in use of, of blockchain technology outside of just cryptocurrency. So. Thank you. Any, any other questions as we wrap up? I think we, you know, a lot of my comments came in between because I didn't want to wait till the end. I felt it was good to kind of tag team with Amy and Cynthia along the way, but are there any last questions? Because I don't, I don't have any other closing remarks except to say thank you for, for being patient. I know we ran a little long, but we'd rather make sure we cover everything thoroughly. We had the time to do it um, and, uh, you know, address questions, but we're, we're very grateful for, you know, friends and clients who, who, who participated with us in our first uh, round of this and we'll refine it a little more, but we plan on doing this again on a more regular basis so that we can make sure that people are hearing what we're seeing and thinking, um, you know, along the way. But we do want to appreciate our gratitude and thanks for, for uh, being, being here today with us and listening. So any other thoughts, Cynthia or Amy? Um, I just want to add that we do recognize the pain and anxiety you're going through right now. Um, and want to let you know we are here for you. Um, everyone's situation is different and unique. Um, so please reach out to your advisor for further discussions on any major changes of your financial goals with your needs. Um, and and we, will, uh, we are here for you. All right, with that, we're gonna sign off. We really do appreciate everyone. Enjoy the weekend and the, your fathers that are online. Happy Father's Day this weekend, okay? All right, yeah, take care Father's all. Day. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.